We talk a lot about books on this channel. We mostly talk about books that I have really loved, and we talk about books that I think you or basically anybody should read. Um, and sometimes I talk about books that I'm just reading because I think they're books worth reading, and I like to share those with you. But I wanted to tell you quickly about a time in my life when I didn't like reading anymore. The story is not particularly interesting, and so thankfully it's pretty short. I was in graduate school, I was working on my PhD in philosophy, and I was reading a lot, but I was pretty much only reading philosophy, and honestly most of the stuff I was reading was highly specific, um, which is what you need to do if you're doing research. I mean, there's a virtue to doing that. but. Um, while I enjoyed the intellectual labor, I found that in my free time, I just wasn't reading any books. This was a bit odd because, at least growing up as a kid, I loved reading. I had always been a really big reader. Maybe in college I read for fun a little bit less, um, but I still read some, and then I got to grad school, and it was like my reading almost completely disappeared. I would read maybe three books for fun every year, which just considering how much I can now read um, is kind of astounding, and considering how much I had read before that um, is kind of sad. Near the end of my dissertation, about a year before I defended, I decided that I wanted to just start reading again. The problem is that if you haven't read in a while, it can be really hard to find books that make you want to read. See, reading is kind of like a muscle. It deteriorates if it isn't worked out or exercised enough. And also, it needs some resistance. But often training it, especially when it's been dormant for a long time, uh, can hurt a little bit. You can get kind of sore. So you got to find the right books. And so I wanted to talk to you about the four books that helped me love reading again. One of the nice things, I should say, is that I'm able to remember which books I read and in roughly what order because... Um, this was the year I decided to keep a reading journal. It was part of keeping myself accountable. I've talked a little bit about that reading journal in another video. Since I still have that journal, I'm able to look back at it and say, wow, that's the book that I was reading at the time. So I don't have the copy that I read of this book because actually I read a digital copy at the time. I was a big Kindle reader, still read it sometimes. I read it a lot less often now, mostly read physical books. So I have a physical copy though of this book and I'm really glad about that. Um, and this is, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's The Dispossessed. Le Guin, I would say, of all of these authors, is the writer that made me love reading again. She is, without a doubt, maybe the best 20th century uh, science fiction writer, um, certainly top three. I think if we're talking about most philosophically interesting sci-fi writers, um, she's top of the list. And she wrote a good fantasy series with uh, Earthsea. But The Dispossessed just came to me really at the right time. It was a philosophically interesting book, an exploration in the philosophy of anarchism, in ideas about politics, and actually really introduced me to the idea that a novel could explore a philosophical idea without being particularly preachy, that in fact you could see a lot of ambiguity in her works, and I would say actually this is one of Le Guin's real strengths. She doesn't succumb to what I would call a kind of trite moralism. She often shows that Basically, in the real world, or even in these fantasy worlds, if there are humans, then our options are always ambiguous and nuanced and complicated. And she explores all of those complexities and all of those nuances. This isn't to say that Le Guin doesn't take stands or that she doesn't have morals or politics. Of course she does. But I think that she expresses them so well and so in such interesting ways that um, I'm okay with seeing that kind of message. And... Uh, I want to engage with her thinking. Some books feel like conversations, and uh, I definitely think The Dispossessed is one of them. It's also structurally a really fascinating book. It has some interesting things with time. Um, the book almost takes some of its philosophical themes and then weaves it into the form so that form, content, and theme all mingle together in this really delightful way. Man, picking this up, this book up, it was like a, it was like a little miracle for me. Uh, it was like suddenly, literature was interesting again. Literature was compelling, and some people are gonna say, sure, the thing that made you like reading again was science fiction. Um, and don't you like to talk about classic novels and things? And I'm gonna say, yeah, we're gonna get to that. We're gonna talk a little bit about those kind of books uh, in just a minute. Um, but I also love science fiction. I also love fantasy, and I also love the stuff that has literary value. And you can find it in those genres. And you can find it in every work by Le Guin. 
I'll probably do like win videos in the future. Um, the, the problem is I want to do them right. I want to make them really good. If I want to talk about Le Guin, like she deserves it. Maybe one day I'll make a video that's good enough to talk about her work. Um, it's very special to me. I love its death. Um, and I was deeply saddened when she passed. After I had read Le Guin, I decided that I would maybe still keep in that fantasy science fiction kind of realm and maybe take it a little easy, keep it a little light at first. And I had remembered that I had read a Terry Pratchett novel a couple of years prior. I had read The Color of Magic which is the first uh, Discworld novel. And I liked it. I thought it was really funny. And then people had said that it wasn't as good as the rest. And I was thought it was pretty good. So that's fine. And then I thought maybe things changed too much. So I thought, oh, well, you know, I like this one, but everyone says that one's not as good as the other ones. So maybe they're wrong and maybe the other ones are bad. It was a bad thought process, but it's the one that I was engaged in. But finally I got around to it and um, I read another digital copy to this book. So I now have a hardback. So I'm gonna show you, but um, I read guards guards from the city watch series in discworld by terry pratchett and and if i met a teenager who said they didn't like to read um but i wanted them to read someone who i thought was intelligent um i would choose terry pratchett probably uh, he's funny um he's got wordplay but he also has just dumb silly jokes which are great um discworld itself is just like a fun world and um discworld is like my candy in my literary diet um, I like it a lot. Um, I, 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 I miss Terry Pratchett um, as well. You probably don't need me to say go read Discworld. It's one of those those books. If you know it, you know it. If you've read it, you probably like it. Um, but I just got to say, I, I owe him a great debt. I owe Terry Pratchett a great debt because again, he just kept that that ball rolling for me. I had started to like reading again because of Le Guin, and then suddenly. Pratchett entered into my life and I realized, wow, this is a whole series. There's like 40 books. I can read them all. Um, and, I, I, and I haven't read all of the Discworld novels, but I've read an awful lot of them at this point. I loved almost every single one. There are a few duds, but we won't talk about those. After I had kind of built up those fiction reading muscles again, I was ready to take on something a little bit harder. And I picked up Crime and Punishment. Once again, I read a digital copy. Um, while I don't love Kindles all that much anymore. Um, at the time, it was what I needed, and I'm glad I had it. Um, Crime and Punishment is uh, in my top five favorite novels. Um, absolutely, I think it's great. You know, other books from this period don't typically make it into my top five. Um, the Dispossessed is not in my top five favorite novels, uh, even though Le Guin is probably one of my top five favorite writers. But Crime and Punishment, I think, is pretty much uh, as close to a, a perfect novel as there exists. This is not the translation I read. Um, either I'll put the notes for the translation that I liked uh, down below. I don't speak Russian, even though I, I read like an awful lot of stuff by Russians, but I don't speak or read Russian, so um, I can't comment on the quality of the prose. Um, I thought the translation that I read was, was really wonderful. Again, there'll be a link down there. I'll at least help you find it somehow, put the ISBN in. Um, Dostoevsky, obviously, is a very philosophically motivated fiction writer. He is a fantastic novelist. He's a wordsmith. He's funny. He's funny as hell. Everyone wants to talk about how Crime and Punishment or all these other books are serious and philosophical and deep and dark, and that's absolutely true. Um, but Dostoevsky is just genuinely a funny guy. Uh, there's almost moments of slapstick in Crime and Punishment. If you're interested in existentialism, so you're interested in those the, those uh, philosophical issues, Dostoevsky is necessary reading. Everyone's going to tell you to read Brothers K, right? Uh, Brothers Karamazov. Or maybe they'll teach you to read uh, Notes from Underground. For my money, the better book is Crime and Punishment. I continued to read a lot of fiction in the last year and a half or so of my PhD. Um, this is when I read uh, The Three Body Problem and uh, the subsequent novels by Xi Jin Le. I thought those were great. Um, I read The Martian Chronicles by Ray Bradbury. All of those were great. I was just consuming a lot of books. I was reading fairly widely again. I felt good. I was still reading my philosophy stuff for my dissertation or for classes I was teaching, but I was reading a, a lot of fantasy, a lot of science fiction, and some literature kind of mixed in. Then I finished my dissertation. I got married and I moved to Texas. Uh, got a job outside of academia, started working, and for a little while didn't want to read philosophy anymore. You know, I, I kind of felt like I'd broken up with philosophy because I had chosen to go into a non-academic job mostly because of a dismal academic job market. Um, 
then I decided to read a, a work that I knew I should have read um, before. And uh, this book was it was huge for me. This book changed the way I think about philosophy in a lot of ways, um, which is kind of funny to happen right after you finish your PhD. Um, but also, it made me want to read philosophy, even, even though I wasn't um, in the academy anymore. And uh, that is After Virtue by Alistair McIntyre. If you wanted to ask me about um, works by living philosophers that I think are worth reading, um, After Virtue is top of the list. A Secular Age by Charles Taylor is also pretty close to the top. Um, the work of Elizabeth Anderson, who's a feminist philosopher in Michigan, especially her work called Private Government, I think is another one that's really close um, to the top. Um, those would probably be the first three that come to mind. I'll talk more about contemporary or living philosophers in a future video. McIntyre changed the way I thought about philosophy in part because of the way he argues, which is to give long histories and analyses of problems to then come to new interesting philosophical conclusions. He's always tracing the problem back. This was not the way I was trained to think about philosophy. And while I don't think you always have to do this, sometimes it's really, really valuable and it can be incredibly illuminating. Um, I also think that McIntyre's discussion of, for instance, uh, the role that Caritas plays in Thomas Aquinas's ethics as it transforms Aristotle and thus virtue ethics is transformed by Aquinas. All this is, is, is great stuff. If you are interested in ethics at all, and especially virtue, but um, just ethical theory in general, or if you're someone who, who's often wondered why moral disputes can often feel, as, as McIntyre puts it, a little shrill or um, kind of empty, lacking in content, um, After Virtue really is a central reading. I don't have an exact tally of how many books I've read since I read these books, but over the past five years, I read several hundred books, something along those lines. And I can say without a doubt though, that I wouldn't have been able to do it without any of these. One of my goals for this channel actually is to help you find those books that are gonna ignite your love of reading, especially the great books, the classics, the Western canon, and with a heavy dose of philosophy. If that sounds appealing to you, maybe subscribe. Also check out my podcast at theclassicalmind.com where we do deep dives into the great books of the Western canon. All right, I think that wraps it up for us. So I'll say take care and I'll see you next time.